Hey folks, Matthew Weiss here, WeissAdvice.com and Weiss Advice here on YouTube. In this video, I want to be taking a look at rock drums, but I'm going to do it from a very different perspective. I don't do a lot of rock stuff here on the channel. There is sort of this pigeonholing effect where most of the time I'm showing the work that I work on, and as I work on that work, I continue to get hired for that, and so I end up getting a little bit pigeonholed, and I think every engineer goes through that, but actually I have a pretty extensive background in rock. I love rock, and these track outs were brought to my attention from a Weiss Advice member during a coaching session. They come courtesy of Produce Like a Pro, which is a fantastic channel, great academy, good friends of mine over there, and I have some tutorials up on that channel as well. So let's take a listen to this record and then let's discuss how to approach the drums and show some technique. Okay, so these drums sound great. They they really sound excellent just faders up. Right now, all we're hearing is the bass, the drums, and the guitars, but all of my effects are bypassed except for a couple of little polarity switches on some of the drums. But this is basically just faders up. So sometimes when we get something that sounds really good, just faders up, we become... Uh, we, we sort of hit, hit a different obstacle than if we throw something faders up and it doesn't sound very good. If I'm working on drums, I throw the faders up and they don't sound very good, I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe I can do some fixing or maybe I can do some sample replacement or sample augmentation. And it's very obvious what needs to be done because there's glaringly things that are wrong. But when something is like this, where it just sounds good by putting the faders up, it becomes less about what, what do I have to do and it becomes more about, well, what should I do? And that's very, very subjective and ambiguous. So typically, the first thing to do would be to listen to the producer's rough because that's going to give us the idea of how they're envisioning the track and if we agree with that then great if we disagree with that then you know maybe we have a conversation and we talk about direction I've listened to Phil's mix uh, Phil is an excellent engineer here he did the tracking and he did a mix of this and his mix is great so I'm going to go a little bit abstract here and I'm going to ignore his mix because he already did it and I'm going to pretend like well what if somebody just sent this to me and said do your thing well okay so what do, what do we need to do? Where do we even start, right? That's kind of the hardest thing in the world. Like we just start kind of tweaking things and moving things, but we don't necessarily have a direction. So I think the very first step in mixing ever is to find your direction. So how do we do that? How do we figure out what the sound of the drums should be? Well, the context comes from the sound of everything else. What does the bass sound like? What do the guitars sound like? That's going to tell us what the drums should sound like. Okay, let's play this one more time and listen to it. So we've got basically hard rock with some post-punk influence here. I'm going to show you an example of not a good direction first. I'm going to mute all of these other drums here except for the overheads, and I'm going to pull in the outside kick mic as well. So let's push up these overheads here, and let's push up this mic here. I think pretty quickly we can say that's not the right sound. Now, do the overheads sound good? Does it sound like actually a decent kit that way? Yeah, it kind of does. Like if we were doing something that was more classic rock influenced and there were other instrument sounds that would complement that idea, I think that starting from here is actually a really good place. But that's not what this record is giving me. This record is giving me something that wants to be a little bit more aggressive and edgy. So I'm much more inclined to listen to the more aggressive and edgy sounds that are in the kit or that have been tracked in. So I'm thinking things like, hey, what about maybe this crush mic? What happens if I just rely on the crush mic and nothing else? And right off the bat, my ear tells me that's not the sound, but that kind of works. So this idea, this framing is going to give me a direction. So I can say, okay, well, what are my more aggressive mics? Those are going to be things like the crushed mics, uh, 
you know, maybe like very close mics, relying on them a little bit more than the overheads. Really like the snare bottom might be something that is really valuable in this particular case. Let's examine the snare bottom here and just see how that feels. Well, first of all, by itself. Now let's pull in the snare top. Let's do the same thing. Don't think what should be, just go off your gut instinct. What feels like it works better with the record? Snare bottom. Snare top. Now there isn't a right or wrong here, but if I just cast aside what I think drums are supposed to sound like and go with what tonally it feels like it works better for me, I actually like the snare bottom. Now, a lot of the times, things like close hat, close toms, uh, snare bottom, a lot of the times we're chucking them out the window. A lot of the times we don't need those, but a lot of the times we're chucking them out the window because they don't sound good. <laughs> I want to point out the fact that Phil's snare bottom here actually sounds really good. Now I have a course on Produce Like a Pro that's about recording drums. And one of the things that I point out and demonstrate is that snare bottom is usually recorded in a way that isn't really the best way to do it. Uh, I'll go through it pretty quick, but the basic idea is this. If this is the resonant head, meaning the bottom head of the snare, most of the time people are putting the snare bottom like that. So they're really just picking up the sound of the snare bands. However, if we think about it, if here's the rest of, you know, here's the hollow part of our snare and then here's our batter head, the snare top is up here, right? So first of all, just from a phase point of view, if we've got this much distant from the resonating head and we want to get the sound of the snare, we probably want the same amount of distance from the bottom and then flipped, right? Polarity flipped. So one thing I stress is try putting a little bit more distance in the snare bottom. The other thing I like to do is I like to use really directional microphones that can handle high SPL. So large diaphragm dynamics are a really good pick, especially because things like an RE20 or an SM7 give us a little bit more weight and a little bit more low end. Well, when I look at how Phil tracked this, not only do I hear some space in the actual snare bottom, we can hear that there's distance between the actual mic and the resonant head. And if I look at the labeling, I can see the snare top is a 57, the snare bottom is an SM7, which is a large diaphragm dynamic. Right, so either Phil watched my course or great minds think alike. Probably the latter, but I don't know, maybe. <laughs> anyway, it's just nice to see that another really, like, really experienced engineer, particularly in this genre, is kind of doing things the same way. It's always nice to have that validation. Okay, let's get back on track here. So I like the sound of this snare bottom, but I think it does need some work. In reality, it's hard to get a snare bottom to sound like the main sound of a snare. So how do we do it? Well, first of all, let's listen to what we have. We have a good sounding start, I think. It is a little bit focused into the mid-range. I hear most of the sound kind of living in that 800 to like 1.6K kind of zone, so it is making it feel a little bit narrower than it should. Uh, it's also, like, it's a pretty full sound overall, but it could definitely be a little bit fuller. Like, I want it to be really, to have, like, a heavy body. And this is kind of the same way I'd be thinking about a snare top. And then lastly, there is a little bit of room in there, and that does sink things back, so I may or may not want to gate it. Now, let's, let's go here. So first of all, I have a few things on deck that I may or may not use. One is the Slate FG36A, which is a really cool sound when it works, and it pretty quickly doesn't work when it doesn't, which is really nice because then I can just turn it on or turn it off and it's either going to be great or it's going to be terrible and I can move on. Uh, if the bleed is not something that can really be managed correctly, it tends to not work so well. If it can be managed, it can be great. A gate because we might want to cut down on some of that room tone and maybe some of the kick just to make things feel a little closer and some saturation in case we want to color it up a little bit more. Okay, but that's not our first thing. Our first thing is, for me, the body. Now, I could EQ and change the tone first because I think that's an equal consideration. I don't think it matters if we EQ first, then compress, or compress, then EQ. We're just going to be reacting to different things, so ultimately we're going get, to get similar results. I ended up going with some compression first. I want to hear much more body in the sound of this snare. 
This 1176 emulation here is backwards. I'm really sorry, guys. Uh, this is going from fast to slow. An actual 1176 goes from slow to fast, so don't let these controls fool you. This is a fast release and a medium to slow attack on an 1176 with a harder knee, the 12 to 1 ratio. And here's our before and after. So again... You can hear I'm hitting it pretty hard. It's getting a little splatty. I might want to back off it a little bit later, but for now, I kind of dig that. Next, I want to kind of get the tone out of that center range. So here I'm doing a 4 dB cut to 800 hertz. I'm adding 4 dB to like, I guess about 150, and then I'm adding a 4 dB shelf from 5K. So basically making a big smile curve with about 4 dB. Now, when I unbypass this, it's going to sound like I'm exaggerating the brightness, maybe a little too much. Keep in mind, this is a close snare capture. Things that are close on the mic tend to, or close to the source, tend to need a little exaggeration to sound right when we bring in everything. So here's our before and after. So lifts it right up, right? Now we are getting a little spiky again. So my last piece of this, and this is typical for the way that I usually am mixing rock drums, only I'm usually doing this to the snare top, not as often to the snare bottom. I then end it all off with a limiter. Here, I'm not particular about the limiter, to be honest. They just give me different characters. I wanted to try this limiter, so this is the first time I'm using it. Here I've got the compression set over toward limit, and yeah, just set the threshold to do maybe 3 dB of reduction, something like that. So here's before and after. All right, cool. And let's back off the level overall a little bit more. So now let's go back to our pre-chain here and let's mess around with this a little bit. First, let's try the FG36A. So there's definitely way too much bleed for this to be workable, I think. But you can hear how there's this like really cool top end texture that immediately shows up. So you can imagine that in certain circumstances, and even for program drums, this can sound really, really cool on snare. But this time we're leaving it out. Next, a little bit of gating. I feel like we've got a little too much room going on. So I am reducing a little bit of the kick bleed, but mainly I'm actually looking to reduce a little bit of the room tone here. I want to point out that my gain reduction range is only 4.5 dB. One of the biggest mistakes I think that people make when they're recording drums is overgating their drums. Don't do that, because when you do that, you kill the body of the sound. If I were to pump this up to like, you know, hard gating... Listen to how much of the snare I'm losing. This is what I had beforehand. It's like it's really choking off the, the tail. So let's go to something that's a little bit more subtle and retain a little bit more of that body. Now I've got the full sound of the snare, and does it have a little bit more room than the hard gate? Yeah, it does, but it sounds just better. It sounds more like the actual snare. And we could always tighten it up later if we choose to. And then lastly, let's try the saturation. I love that. I, I find this New York saturator thing, I'm not even really sure what it's supposed to be emulating or doing, but I find that it works really nicely on snares, so I tend to go to it and see if it works. It doesn't always work, and none of these things always work, but this time it seems like it's doing its thing. Let's take all these effects off. Much bigger, much bolder, much more in your face. And, you know, now we can hear it in the mix.
So where do we go from here? Because I'm going to wrap this tutorial up at about this point, but it's very much unfinished, obviously. So where do we go from here? Well, we start following the same idea that we started with. We're looking for the more aggressive captures. We're looking for a sound that's going to give us more edge, more fizz, that's going to match the idea of the guitar, the idea of the bass. And so next, I might, before I bring in the overheads, maybe bring in like one of the crush mics and find a good balance there and make that kind of the sound that I'm conforming everything else in the kit around. Now, for a lot of people, this is a big no-no. And say, wait, making the snare bottom your primary snare, close snare capture? That's crazy. That's not done. No, it is done, actually, sometimes. It's not very common, but there's also no rule against it. We know we know the ideas, we know the guidelines, but we can bend, we can bend them, we can break them, and it doesn't really matter if it makes other engineers happy. A lot of other engineers will say this is just not, Matt's giving terrible advice, this is just not how it's done. No, it's just not often how it's done. But if it feels right for the record, then it's going to work out really, really well. So I want you guys to open your mind to the different things that you can do. I want you to pay attention. The counter idea is true as well. Don't get enchanted by the idea of doing things so differently that you make something sound terrible for the, for the sake of making it sound different. That's not good either. Uh, but be start with the creative idea right that's the heart of everything and then follow through with that creative idea and see where it leads oh the guitars are really square wavish and fizzy because it's high gain matching into these fuzz pedals okay what if the drums were kind of matching that idea what if i was using the crush mics as like the rooms and the the back basis of the the sound and then maybe leaning more on the snare bottom for the tone and the texture no law against it all right, so let's wrap up there. If you dig this video, hit that like button. If you want to catch more videos like this, hit subscribe. Oh, wow. Hit subscribe with the bell notification so you get notified. Special thanks to Produce Like a Pro. Check out their channel. They've got a lot of great stuff going on there. Uh, and then also, if you sign up for that Weiss Advice newsletter, there's not a lot of time left, but you will get that low-end guide for free. Only got till the end of the New Year's, though, so take advantage of that right now. And lastly, you know what we say, we are musicians, sound is our instrument, and I will catch you next time.